What's up YouTube? My name is Clickwood and I am back again bringing you guys a new video here on my channel and today I am joined by my friend Project KSL also known as Dustin, my usual partner on the Fantasy Football Swagger podcast. But today guys, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We of course are big fans of fantasy football, but we're also big fans of the NFL in general. So what we decided that we wanted to do was do a little bit of pick 'em every week here on my channel. Uh kind of go in depth a little bit on the games, talk about some things that are happening with the teams. Um, you know, it might help you not only with just, you know, knowing more about football in general, but it might also help you with your fantasy teams as well. We're not going to talk about those things specifically, but some of these types of things that we do speak about here could potentially help you with that as well. So with that being said, I want to introduce my friend Dustin. Like I said, he is a football geek, just like myself, (laughs) big old Broncos Homer. And, uh, Aren't you, Dustin? You're big. You're I, you're actually a huge Denver Broncos fan. Uh, have been for a long time, not yeah. just a bandwagoner, right? No, no, I'm born and raised in Colorado. Yeah, so my big whole old fan Bronco of Broncos. Fans. Yeah, I mean we're all Bronco fans here, and they've been real good recently. So it's been good times in Colorado recently. So yeah, this is a guy who uh, has always been hyping up all the Broncos players. Yeah, I remember a point in time when he was Don't hyping up Tim Don't Tebow to me, no, and it's a myth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but now those days are in the past. Uh, he actually has a legitimate quarterback that he can hype up, and we'll get into that nope. a little bit. But uh, but first, I want to start things off talking about Thursday night's game this week, and we have the Minnesota Vikings as they head to Green Bay to take on their biggest rival, the Green Bay Packers. And, of course, Green Bay, they're not their biggest rival is not the Vikings. It's kind of funny. <laughs> I live in Minnesota, and all the Vikings fans, we have this this high and mighty opinion of ourselves that, like, oh, Green Bay hates us. No, they hate the Bears. The it's Vikings are like the – the, It is for the Vikings, but for the Packers, they'd you rather beat the Bears. You don't think Green Bay fans really give a shit? They do, but, I mean, the Packers fans are so crazy. They, they just want to beat everybody. But, yeah. like, I think that they'd rather beat the Bears is all I'm saying. But Oh, yeah, one-to-one, definitely, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, um, yeah, so what I really wanted to talk about today uh, was kind of the in-depth things on each of these games, talk a little bit about them. Um, So we're starting off again, like I said, with the the Vikings at the Packers, and this one's kind of an interesting game because the Vikings have actually looked okay without Adrian Peterson. I mean, this past week, we got to see our first sightings of Teddy Bridgewater. He looked pretty good before he got hurt. Yeah, no, he definitely, he looked really good, actually, I mean... I mean, you kind of got to put it in perspective because you don't want to get too overzealous because it was the Atlanta Falcons who just have an atrocious defense this year. But Right, right. Uh, he but did. the Packers have an atrocious defense that's, too. That's a good point, yeah. But, I mean, Teddy got hurt in that game, so you kind of wonder what percentage he'll really be at, you know? Mm-hmm. He did roll his ankle, yeah. it seemed like. So, I mean, I don't I don't know what what uh, percentage he'll really be at for this game. But, yeah, no, I mean, the Green Bay – or the – excuse me, the Minnesota offense has looked good since uh, – Adrian went away. I mean, uh, Jared McKinnon came in there, rushed for over 100 yards on limited carries. Yeah, Asiata yeah. had three TDs. You know, and you assume Cordero Patterson will get going at some point, but Jarris Wright kind of emerged as Teddy's go-to guy, and they still have Greg Jennings. That offense has some things going for it. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. Like I said, they've they've really been able to continue to move the ball, which, uh, I mean, I'm not not overly optimistic about their chances to do that throughout the rest of the season, but, I mean, for right now... They've got a lot of they they actually have a lot of underrated skill position guys I think on the team um, and it'll be interesting to kind of see how they match up against the Packers on the road here I think a lot of people are going to be expecting that this is going to be a complete blowout based on right. what Green Bay did last week uh, but I'm not I'm not exactly sure I mean the spread right now is Green Bay by ten I think really? that is might be that a little high? bit much yeah yeah no I, that that does seem high. Not that, again, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a 10-point game, but for a spread to be that high is kind of wild. I, yeah. I I think it'll be, if I had to pick, a, if I had to take a guess, I'd probably say it'll be a 7-point game. Because like I said, I think Green Bay's defense is just complete ass. I think their offense yeah. is overrated. Minnesota's offense and their defense, frankly, has looked better in the past few weeks, too. So I, I can see it being a close game, definitely, especially if Teddy plays, which they expect him to. I, so you're not expecting a repeat of last week Aaron Rodgers throwing four no, touchdowns? It, in all likelihood, no. I mean, Josh Robinson actually shut down Roddy White last game, too. True. He's had a good year this year for corners. So I think yeah. that he'll be on maybe Jordy, maybe Randall Cobb. That'll probably limit the offense a little bit. Aaron Rodgers, other than that game last week versus Chicago, really hasn't been very good this year. Or at least not up to his standards, anyways, that most right. people expect right. for Aaron Rodgers. So, no, I, I don't expect it to be like a 45-7 to game or anything like that. 
Yeah, me either. I think um, I, I actually do expect this game to be closer. If it was in Minnesota, I think that there's a real possibility that Minnesota might be able to squeak out the win here. But, you know, it, I just I, I think I'm going to take Green Bay in this one. But uh, I do think it's going to be less than that 10 points spread. You yeah, agree? yeah, I'm, I'm picking Green Bay, too. I mean, it, it is worth saying that Adrian Peterson usually just owns Green Bay. So mm-hmm. if he was playing in this game, I think I was a good shot. Even if it's in Green Bay, I might take the the, uh, the Vikings just for with how bad Green Bay's defense has been playing lately. But yeah, I, I think without Adrian Peterson, Matt Asiata, Jared McKinnon, uh, Teddy Bridgewater banged up, like we said, I, I think I would still pick Green Bay probably without much hesitation. All right, so let's move on to another team in that division. They are going to be uh, the Chicago Bears who are heading to Carolina to take on the Panthers. And uh, this is kind of a tale of two very interesting teams up yeah. until this point. Because Carolina last year was one of the juggernaut teams in the NFL. They were going out there kicking the crap out of teams and uh, really looked like they had a possibility of making a deep run into the playoffs. And then this year, they just they can't move the ball a bit on offense. Right. Uh, defensively, they look like shit, too. I mean, it's like they're yeah. just they're bad across the board, honestly. Carolina has not looked well, good. One thing worth saying about Carolina is everyone seems to remember they went 11 and five last year. They had such a good year. They went in the playoffs, and frankly, they were at the one yard and the, they were at the one yard line in that playoff game versus San Francisco. Like, well, like three or four times, and they could have easily blown out San Francisco in that game. Crazy it seems. Yeah. And they just got stuffed at the one repeatedly. Yeah. But they started off like shit last year too. I remember. I True. remember people were saying that like, what did they? What did they start off last year? Like two and two or something like that. Two and three. They did not start Something off very like good that. last year. Yeah, and then yeah. They, they had those they had those statement wins where they went into San Francisco and they won. So like I I agree it's a different team. They don't have Steve Smith who's just been prospering to the furthest degree in Baltimore. But Kelvin Benjamin's a stud. The biggest issue is that offensive line is a complete train wreck. Like I don't think <laughs> yeah. that'd even be a starting offensive line for like the Pac-12 right now. It is yeah. dreadful. So USC that, can trot out a better team right now. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like line. Alabama could go out there and have a better offensive line to protect Cam Newton. <laughs> Cam Newton Terry has a fractured rib. You really wonder if that's going to be a recurring thing for the whole season, which you probably yeah. think it will. So it, it, there, really, there's a lot of negative things going on, too. And especially one thing that no one really talked about last year was Carolina's secondary was ass last year, too. They did not have a good secondary. Just that pass yeah. rush in that front seven was so good it covered it up. Yeah, but this year their front seven hasn't been anywhere near as good. Right, I mean, r- right great. now they're 27th against the run. Charles Johnson has been dreadful this year, too, who has been a pretty One like the... consistent he's... stud players for them on that defense recently. Right, and he's his just contract is still year. increasing, isn't it? I think, yeah. I mean, they signed yeah. him to that a huge deal when D'Angelo Williams is a free agent, too. I think it's like $70 million or something for him. Yeah, he signed that's... a huge contract. So crazy, but... Yeah. Uh, this is this looks like a kind of game that could be kind of a bounce back for the Bears as far as they're running the ball. Matt Forte has yeah. been struggling running the ball, but to me, this looks like one of those games where I know it's on the road, but it's not like Carolina is a particularly hostile place to play or anything. No, not really so <laughs> for a massive home field advantage, yeah, I mean, they're a dangerous environment. Or yeah, anything. so I mean, to me, it, it's not that big of a deal that they're on the road here, but uh, it, it's. I think that Matt Forte really does have a good opportunity here. I, I saw a, a stat earlier that somebody uh, posted on Twitter that said something along the lines of that Matt Forte is averaging like 130 yards per game in four games against the Panthers over his career. Now, granted, that goes back a few years, but it does right. give you the idea that uh, Matt Forte has had success against similar rosters to this yeah i remember that so, one game a few years ago where he caught a bunch of balls and i think he had like 100 yards receiving or something in that game too he yeah. had an insane game a few years ago yeah, and that stat that that person posted was just rushing oh, so okay. it doesn't even so, yeah, take I... into consideration the passing and, and matt forte of course as we know from fantasy is definitely one of the best receiving running backs in the league so yeah. um yeah it's it's going to be interesting the the other thing that's kind of interesting in this one is that the panthers basically have nothing at their running back position right yeah. now uh, they signed chris ogbenaya yeah. Off of the waiver wire, um, Darren Browns. Reeves and him have been splitting carries in practice. We don't really know what the situation is there. Uh, from a fantasy standpoint, I know we're going <laughs> to talk about this more. Uh, stay the hell away yeah, from this one. Either way, it's a shitter. Who cares? Yeah, either way, it's uh, a shitter. Who cares? We know Chicago's defense is nothing special, but Carolina's offense has really not been good. Uh, Cam Newton hasn't had a Cam Newton-like game yet this year. Yeah. Really, the only guy who has looked good in this offense right now is Kelvin Benjamin. Greg Olson's been serviceable as well. I shouldn't, yeah, I shouldn't crap on him too much. But yeah. um, but other than that, this offense has just been freaking awful. 
So I'm I'm a little bit worried about that. Now I did see that the Panthers are currently listed as a three point favorite in this one, really? and to me, I I don't get that. Yeah, no, I think that's 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 ridiculous. Yeah, that's got to be one where uh, where I'm definitely going to be taking uh, the the uh, Bears in this one. So yeah, no, I I think this might be the game too where we finally see. I mean, Jared Allen has kind of looked a little washed this season too, but. You think that this game with him and Lamar Houston, this might finally be the game versus that just horrible Panthers offensive line. They kind of come out and have a statement game. Right. I can see that happening. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to pick the pairs. I mean, at that being said, I'm not going to be entirely shocked if the Panthers do manage to win. But yeah, I mean, you have to pick Chicago. They've had some big statement wins this year. I think everyone's letting the Green Bay game get in their head a little bit too much. And Jay Cutler usually isn't good versus Green Bay for right. whatever reason. But they've been good this year prior to that. Beat the Jets in New York. Beat San Francisco in San Francisco. So, yeah. And uh, do we know right now what the status of Alshon Jeffrey is? I mean, and and Brandon Marshall. Frankly, um, we've seen both of them I, be banged up. I remember seeing that they said that. I think they finally said that Marshall actually just what's being said is Marshall might finally get a week of rest, so they might not have Brandon Marshall. But I think Ooh. Alshon Jeffrey is going to play. Is what I've seen. I think it's questionable <sighs> what they expect him to play. Wow. With Brandon Marshall being out, that does change things a little bit. I'm because he's he's kind of Jay Cutler's little nookie blankie. <laughs> he <laughs> so, still has Martellus Bennett, who's been a stud this year. Martellus Bennett has true. monster games. He still still have Alshon. That's true, but it's it's Marty B, man. Like you're not going to convince me that Martellus know, Bennett's I, suddenly like this rock star tight end. No, but I, he's been good he started before. off hot last year too, man. Well, I mean, hot. he's the number one tight end in PPR right now for fantasy, man. Okay, fair enough, but I mean, we have to assume this dude's not going to continue at this pace. I mean, no, sure. On. I don't expect him to catch 20 TDs or anything, but I, th- I think that in, in a game where they miss Brandon Marshall versus a terrible Panthers secondary, I could see them. I could still see him having a pretty good game, especially with Alshon Jeffrey still on the field. If Alshon and Marshall both miss, then I think there's some like, uh, I don't know then. Yeah. Well, I, either way, I think that they're going to be definitely relying on Matt Forte quite a bit in this right. one. So hopefully he gets the ball a little more than he has the first couple of games. Next game on the docket, we've got. Cleveland at Tennessee. This one is a fun one for the whole family. Oh, We've got <laughs> That's the shitter of the week. <laughs> yeah, just two awful teams. No real excitement here. I mean, at some point, Johnny Football's got to go out there, right? Well, Hoyers I mean, look good. I mean, it's- he's been okay, but I mean, like, it's just, it's so, it's such a boring, like, just nothing. They're not going to go anywhere with Brian Hoyer at quarterback situation. You know, I, I mean, I, I agree to an extent, but I think honestly, I think so far Brian Ory is probably the least of their worries. That team's defense just hasn't performed at all what we expect their defense to be going into the season. We also Joe um, Hayden has not lived up to expectations. Say. Joe Hayden has not looked like <laughs> Joe Hayden. You wonder yeah. if there's an injury or something going on with him. He just has not been a good corner this year. Or maybe so, he just got that contract and then decided, yeah, said, yeah screw it. it. Yeah, I'm done. Passed <laughs> out, but. No, I, I don't think Hoyer's really the issue. I just don't think the Browns are just that good, you know? Right. They still have a – they still teams. Just the talent on the team is still just subpar as a whole, but they're still probably better than the Titans. And that game is in Cleveland, didn't you say? Uh, the game's actually in Tennessee. Oh, it's in Tennessee? Man. Yes. So I think I'd still probably – I think I'd still pick Cleveland in that game because I think they're yeah. just a better team right now. The, the Titans just have so many issues. Is Locker even going to play? Uh, from the sounds of it, uh, it sounds like he's practiced, but, you know, it's going to be one of those game time decision type of things again. So yeah. we don't really know for certain on that one. I'm going with the expectation that he is going to play, but does that really change much That's for you? That's what I was you? about to say. There's really that big of a difference between him and Whitehurst. I, yeah. I really don't know if it is, man. Like, I really, really don't. Um, their offense is brutal. Yeah, it's uh, terrible. Yeah, it's, it's been terrible so far. You expect Sankey really to fun. finally get carries soon, maybe. Right. Sankey did actually touch the ball more than Sean Green this past week. But, I mean, it, it, the thing is, is Sean Green, all, in all honesty, as far as, like, yards per carry, has been fine. He really has. Yeah. Um, he's not been their biggest issue. So, to Probably me, I don't – well, yeah, that's not saying much at this point, is it? <laughs> but, you know, Tennessee, it, it's it's an interesting situation because they've spent so much money, picks, all this kind of stuff on their offensive line, yeah. and they still just get their asses whipped yeah, every got, week They got by Bill's everybody. guard guy. They got Ruse. Yeah, they, they, got, they drafted uh, Chance Warmack in the top 10. They drafted was it top Michigan 10? guy. It was, like, it was at least top 12. Taylor Lewan, yeah. Chance, yeah. Chance Warmack was top 10. Taylor Lewan was top yeah. 12. They brought in Bill's guard guy, still have Michael Ruse, and they're just still assholes, so. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's just been such a train wreck there for, t- for the Titans this year. 
Uh, I know a lot of their fans had high expectations for the team, especially when they saw Justin Hunter in the preseason just looking like, you know, I had, I honestly had fans of the Titans telling me that Justin Hunter looked like Randy Moss. Yeah, you fell and into that hype a little bit I, too. Okay, I fell into the hype a little bit from the <laughs> fantasy state. I, I wasn't like investing significantly in Justin Hunter or anything, but yeah. Um, but yeah, and I mean, Justin Hunter has not lived up to expectations. The talent's still there. I just don't think there's a quarterback to get him the ball. I was going to say, it's kind of hard to get, judge him really fairly when his quarterback is Jake Locker, who is still atrocious, and Charlie Whitehurst. So Tennessee is the, the favorite in this one by 2.5. 2.5. Yeah, and I am going to take Tennessee in this one. I know you said you're going to take Cleveland. Yeah, Cleveland. I, uh, trust me, this is not a game where I'm super excited to take the Titans, but every team's got to get some wins at some point, right? And no, you <laughs> the Texans went two and fourteen. There's usually just one terrible team every year. So, but the Titans already went in and, into Kansas City and blew out an elite team. Yeah, yeah. You know that train yeah. wreck. <laughs> I'm joking about the Chiefs being an elite <laughs> team. By by the way, guys, the Chiefs are probably one of the most overrated teams that you're gonna find. Every so. Year. Every single year, and especially this year, coming off of that that playoff appearance last year, unexpected. Uh, the Titans just going in there and whipping their ass in Kansas City <laughs> in Week One is so funny. But uh, yeah, I am going to take Tennessee in this one at home against Cleveland. Um, I don't love it. I think it's going to be a crap, garbage game, seventeen thirteen type of a game. Right. But you know, it, it, when the teams are kind of two mediocre teams like this, I tend to just take the home team. So I'm going to go with Tennessee. Let's move on to the next game, and this one is an interesting one because I think conventional wisdom would tell us that St. Louis at Philadelphia is going to be a blowout for Philadelphia, right? But Philadelphia is coming off of what might be the worst performance that we have seen them have offensively in that the I can Chip ever Kelly remember. Era. I mean, not even just the Chip Kelly era. I'm talking like uh, ever. Man, Andy Reid had some shitters. Remember that they game scored ball zero ball offensive bench. points. Yeah, man. But they had, I mean, that's versus a good defense, though, at least. Fair. But zero points. And the other thing, too, about this one is St. Louis is coming off of a bye, which can be overrated to some extent. An early given, bye, too. Uh, yeah. Given the fact that it's an early bye, right? Uh, so Philadelphia is not all banged up or anything like that. But I think the big thing is that they do have that extra week to prepare for the Philadelphia offense, which you know is very, very difficult to prepare for. So it can be one of the small advantages that you take into consideration in a game like this as they head into Philadelphia. But right. But what do you think about this Philadelphia offense? Well, I mean, do you think that what we saw like, from them is kind of what we're going to get? Or are our teams starting to figure this out? Or should we not even not, worry about that? I'm, I mean, we kind of talked about it earlier in the other podcast. I don't think – I'm not concerned about Philadelphia. I'm really not. And St. Louis' defense this year has not been what we expect their defense to be. Their offense has yeah. been atrocious, even though I think they're supposed to get Sean Hill back this week. I, I still – I. I'd, I'd pick the Eagles without any hesitation whatsoever. I think it'll be a two-score game at least. You know what's back funny? Philadelphia, what? You you said about Sean Hill. I, I just want to interrupt there. I actually think that they might stick with Austin Davis. Do you? I you mean, might. he I mean, honestly didn't look that bad against the Cowboys. Yeah, it's the Cowboys. I know, the Cowboys are horrible. <laughs> I get it. But, like, I mean, like, you, you look at his numbers in that game. He threw for over 300 yards. I think he had three touchdowns. Like, Just picked I up mean, Morris Claiborne the entire game. Well... <laughs> you got to do what works, right? I mean, it's not like Philadelphia's defense has stopped anybody. No, they have a bad defense, too. But I, I just think that there's no way they'll be able to keep up. And I really think Chip Kelly's going to be pissed off after that whole 49ers game. I actually I expect too. a big game from a guy like Jeremy Macklin and Nick Foles. And maybe this is the week that finally LaShawn McCoy finally gets rolling, too. <laughs> Yeah, let's hope so, man. It has been an absolute train wreck for that offensive line. They are just getting abused by everybody. Um, you look at the St. Louis defensive line, and if everybody was healthy, things would be looking pretty good. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know. St. Louis, I, I'm not – I just don't think that – you're right. I don't think they have the offensive firepower to keep up. And I, I do think that Philadelphia is going to take this one. So uh, they're seven-point favorite right now. So, I, I mean – I don't know if they beat the, – I think they beat that seven points. I think yeah, that they do I beat St. Do Louis by, by over seven. At home, coming off of a game where they got embarrassed, I, I think you're right that there's probably going to be a little bit of the pissed-off factor, and yeah. uh, they might just go out there and try and make a statement. Now, if they come out there this week and they score 10 offensive points – Yeah, and, then there's some concern to look for, yeah. Yeah, then we're starting to really look at – is this gimmick shit starting to come to an end? Just like everybody was running the stupid wildcat offenses the and the read shit. options. Like, yeah. is all that stuff going to be, you know, picked up on just like the Chip Kelly offenses? Who knows? 
We don't know at this point yet, but uh, in week three, it certainly looked like it. Or excuse me, in week four, it certainly looked like it with the San Francisco 49ers just completely shutting them down. Uh, Next game we have is Atlanta as they go to New York to face the Giants. And I think this is one of the funner games of the week. This one could be the biggest, highest scoring game of the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you you think that Eli Manning and, and the Giants can keep up with that Atlanta offense? Yeah, I do, because I think the Giants' defense is better than the Atlanta uh, defense to just start off with. So Fair. Yeah, I definitely Fair. think they could, and I think that they're finally starting to hit their groove in that new, uh, that more quick timing offense they've been inst- like trying to get installed throughout the whole offseason. It finally seems like they have a sort of thing worked out, and it was so funny in the preseason. People were talking about how they wanted to get Eli Manning to 70% completions, and everyone scoffed at it because <laughs> it was so ridiculous, right? He's yeah. right around that right now. Yeah. He's right around 70%, as crazy as that sounds, so... It, they have him. They have Victor Cruz. Ruben Randall's a good target. Rashad Jennings has been a monster this year thus far. So, I definitely Larry Donnell. Yeah, Larry Donnell. Exactly. I, they definitely have the pieces to be able to keep up. It's at home. Atlanta's defense is still just absolutely dreadful. Offensively, as good as they are, their offensive line is super banged up right now. They're starting to tight end at right, or they're not starting, but a tight end played right right tackle for them last year, or excuse me, last, last week. week. Yeah, I, I think I'd have to pick the Giants in this game. They're at home. They're coming off that big win. That offense is turning around. I like their defense better. I expect Rashad Jennings to get going a little bit more too versus that bad defense. I definitely would pick the Giants in this game. Yeah, the the Giants I think are my team to win this one as well. The Vikings ran all over the Falcons. Yeah, and exactly. that was with uh you know without Adrian Peterson. It was Jarris McKinnon or Jarek McKinnon. I don't know why I said Jarris. Uh, Jarek yeah, McKinnon. Right, you're thinking of. Yeah, um, Jarek McKinnon and uh, Matt Asiata just ran all over them, and I don't see any reason why Rashad Jennings won't do the same thing this week. Atlanta can't run the football. I don't know what it is. Um, Anton no, Smith is back, the so. only guy that has been even just like legitimate for them at all. Stephen Jackson getting is the, the ball back equivalent to Tom Brady. <laughs> kind of, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know what's funny though is Stephen Jackson's like yards per carry aren't that bad. There's just no explosion. Yeah. There's no a threat plotter. of a big play yeah, he's anymore. Like now. So, I mean, to me, there just isn't much to be excited about outside of their passing game. I do still think that you, uh, obviously, you look at the uh, the passing game targets with um, with Roddy and um, Julio, and, you know, it doesn't really get a whole lot better than that. Matt Ryan's going to put up his numbers, and they're going to score some points in this game, but their defense just is such a piece of crap, yeah, and you're right. Terrible. I think that they're coming off of a disappointing loss in a game that they should have won against the Vikings. Um, the Giants are coming off of a big win. So I, I do think that the momentum carries over for the Giants. I like them to win this one as well. Right. Next game we have is a team that just got humiliated by my Dallas Cowboys, oh, and that is the New Orleans Saints as they host the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Tampa Bay looking better with Mike Glennon. Do you think that they have a chance in this one? Yeah, you know, I think it'll be closer because Tampa Bay plays them close every year, even in game, even in years where the Saints are look a lot better than they do this year. The Bucks games are always closer than people would think when they play them. So I don't expect that to be much different for this year, especially. Yeah. I mean, the Tampa Bay is coming off a game where, frankly, they got outplayed the whole game by Pittsburgh. that still got a win. The Glenn came in there. He played better, way better than <laughs> Sean Hill has whole year, all year. But having said that, I still think New Orleans is just a better team. I, I mean, you still, I mean, you have to have some faith in Drew Brees getting it going, don't you? I mean, Man, I... I I look at this this type of game and I don't see how New Orleans doesn't win it. New Orleans is a completely different team on the road than they are at home. They right. they're not even a 500 team on the road. Yeah. But when they're at home, they're like don't lose you know, it's, level awesome on offense. You know what's so funny too is about that is I always remember those things that they were talking about on like ESPN and NFL Network and how pissed off the Saints players got at the notion that they were a different team on the road. And it's yeah. like, no, fuck you. It's entirely true. You don't play worth a shit on the road. <laughs> accept it or eat a dick. And you know what's so sick about it, too, is that they'll go to team, they'll go to a, a place like Dallas where, okay, New Orleans to Dallas, as far as like a travel, is nothing. Yeah, it's not a big travel at all. It, yeah. It's like an hour plane ride, right? I, yeah. I mean, it might be a little bit longer than that, but it's, it's certainly it's not like East Coast to West Coast type travel, right. right? So there's no real lag in their bodies. There's no real reason to not be okay when they get there. And then in addition, addition to that they're playing in basically a dome dallas closed the roof for that game yeah dallas is and, always a dome yeah. yeah so i mean we're we're looking at it and it's like 
Okay, New Orleans, you could make the case that on the road and they go to a place like Seattle or something where it might be raining or, you know, some terrible weather or something. Okay, their offense might be slowed down. There's no excuse for their offense to not just be destroying the Cowboys. The Cowboys have a train wreck for a defense and they were shutting them down. Yeah. I mean, they got a lucky touchdown at the end of the game to Jimmy Graham when it was irrelevant. And, uh, I mean, look, I, I don't like... New Orleans, to be honest with you, this year, uh, after the they first couple of games that we've shit. seen, yeah. yeah, a lot of people expected them to be one of the elite teams in the league this year. Um, that whole division, frankly, is overrated. Right, yeah, trying Tampa to find Bay, a winner out of that division yeah. is just like, uh, I don't know. Every single one of these teams in this division coming into the year were rated higher them. than what they currently are. Yeah, absolutely, all of them. So, I mean, it, it's kind of disgusting, but Tampa Bay, they, they do have that momentum of, of beating Pittsburgh. I mean, that was an astonishing win given the fact that they just got blown out by Atlanta in their previous game. But uh, in this one, I do think it's going to be a lot more similar. Pittsburgh is not the high-powered offense that Atlanta and New Orleans are. So, I mean, to me, I think that I like New Orleans in this one. I don't know if I like them by the 11-point spread. Damn, is it really I, an 11-point spread? It is. Yeah, that's so, way too high. I mean, that's updated as of uh, Wednesday afternoon, but, you know, it could switch that sure slightly. That seems too high, yeah, even. But. Just based, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they beat them by two scores like that, but that, but for that to be that to type of spread, though, is just yeah. like, that seems a little high. Yeah, it's NFL like spreads are same, typically going to box. be, right, and that's what I was going to say. I mean, NFL spreads are typically like a three to seven point spread. Yeah, exactly. So you, you typically give two to two and a half points somewhere in that range for the home team just as like a a base uh, average. So what they're basically saying is that they think new Orleans is an eight and a half point favorite over Tampa Bay at a neutral field. Yeah. And I don't know that I agree with that. (laughs) So, uh, like I said, I think defense just looks so fucking bad. Yeah, definitely overrated. Oh, Um, way overrated. Yeah. Their front seven is not good. Yeah, they're getting right ran now. on like a motherfucker too. Every Dallas is running on everybody, so I don't know if I'd be that worried about that necessarily. But uh, let's move on to talk about the Dallas Cowboys because they're going to be hosting the Houston Texans this week, uh, interstate right. rivalry, but obviously not even in the same conference, so it's really not that much of a rivalry. <laughs> but it is for some of the bragging people rights. in the area. Yeah, right. it is for bragging rights, I guess. You know, you probably got like some stupid thing, like the mayor of Dallas is betting, you know, a, something. Beer. Yeah, some. Beer yes against the the houston guy yeah, you know case whatever beer on the line <laughs> exactly a local case of beer yeah. is on the line like, okay, whatever <laughs> but Star yeah brew yeah. exactly but you know dallas i think uh they're they're a four and a half point favorite in this game dallas has really surprised me i'm a cowboys fan for those of you who don't know i wear my heart on my sleeve with these cowboys but but um I mean, I came into this year expecting them to go six and ten, seven and nine ish, and not because the offense I didn't think was going to be bad, but that defense, man. I looked at it at the beginning of the year and I was just like, okay, they've lost basically every single one of their good players. Like, I mean, you name it from a year ago. Uh, Demarcus Ware is gone. Sean Lee got injured by our dipshit offensive lineman in the preseason. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh god. Uh, and then, um, who else did we lose? We lost somebody else too. Anthony um, Spencer got hurt, but he ended up coming back. You brought, you got, um, uh, uh, he went to Washington. What's his name? Inter- Jason Hatcher. Yeah. Jason Hatcher. There you go. Yeah. Jason yeah. Hatcher, who was pretty damn good at rushing the passer last year. Uh, um, he's been good but- this year too, actually. Yeah, and and that's the thing. Like the Cowboys just lost everything. There was no improvements made to this defense. Oh no, anywhere. it got significantly worse. But but somehow they're performing like like a league average defense. Yeah. Like <laughs> not spectacular, but like not just a complete train wreck. And they were able to kind of slow down New Orleans enough for that for that offense to control the game by running the ball. And obviously, we know Demarco Murray is leading the NFL in rushing by a, like well right. over a hundred yards. I mean, it's MVP race right now too. Yeah, I mean, he's looked real, real good. And if he keeps up this pace, Dallas is definitely going to win that division, in my opinion. Uh, But I don't know that I expect that to continue. So uh, in this game, they have a real big challenge because they're going to be up against J.J. Watt in that Houston front seven, man. Houston's defense is is legit, um, especially with J.J. Watt. I don't know that they're going to be able to run the ball quite as effectively in this game as they have in their previous games. What do you think? Uh, You know, they're they're still without Clowney for a little while. I I think that... Excuse me. I I think that Dallas has done a really good job this year of just being like, we have spent so much money and so many high picks on the offensive line that we're just absolutely retarded not to run the ball. 
Yeah. And they've been running the ball, and it's been working out really well for DeMarco Murray leads the NFL in rushing, like you said. I also think that when you do that, you I mean, obviously, it's not just like a genius to figure it out. If you can keep your defense on the sideline more time or for, for uh, an extended period of time, they will play better because they will be fresher. Correct. So you're hiding, you're hiding That's a lot the of weaknesses with that. Yeah, you're hiding a big weakness with that. You're keeping the you're putting the ball in your best player on offense's hands right now, and you're just you're you have a game plan that works for the way your team is built right now, and I think that's sustainable. There's nothing insane. It's not sustainable. To not, or it's it's crazy to think it's not sustainable to just think that you can just keep running the ball. So I I, I think unless you're going to get some team like Seattle or something, I mm-hmm. think that with all those high picks, all that money invested on that con- on those uh, offensive line, Tyron Smith is throwing people around. I think that they'll probably run the ball. I don't know if it'll necessarily run for 200 yards or anything on Houston, but Houston quarterback is still Ryan Fitzpatrick. I, I still think they'll have to do that. I think they'll be able to execute the majority of their game plan. So I, I think I'd probably, I think I'd pick Dallas to win this game. It's at home for them. They're coming off that big game running games working like it is. And I just don't trust Ryan Fitzpatrick with limited opportunities, presumably because of Dallas's run game to really keep Houston in this game without throwing interceptions and stuff like that. And the other thing too, is that Arian Foster has not looked uh, in this pre- this previous game when he came back. Yeah, he's um, banged up. I think he had what nine carries for nine yards. Yeah, he's banged up. Um, like real bad numbers, and I mean I know that's limited uh, carries, but if he's not looking good, Dallas is going to be in good shape in this game because they're going to be forcing Ryan Fitzpatrick to throw the ball. And like Dustin said, the guy is just prone to throwing interceptions. A lot of people always talk about how Romo's pr- prone to throwing interceptions. You look at the numbers, guys. That is not the case. Yeah, yeah, ten um, last year. Yeah, t- yeah, ten interceptions last year with what thirty-one touchdowns. I mean, you tell me that a quarterback's going to have a three-to-one ratio, and I'm going to tell you that that team's going to be pretty damn good. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, the Cowboys had the worst defense like that I've ever witnessed in the history of the <laughs> NFL, so it didn't work out, and they missed the playoffs. But you know, uh, Romo got them there. Romo got them to the point where they were a, a game away, and he, then at that point, he literally had a broken back. So, you know, wh- what can you do? <laughs> I mean, he was the carrying the team. Yeah, yeah. So. You know, I'm taking the Cowboys in this one. Um, I don't think that it's going to be a blowout, but at the same time, though, I do think that the Cowboys will be able to continue to run the ball at least somewhat effectively. I like the chances of Dallas hitting them deep at least once for a deep touchdown in this one. T. Willie could be, uh, you know, Des Bryant really hasn't gotten a deep pass this year yet, so I would like to see them try and hit him deep. And then the other thing, too, is that when they start to do these play-action passes, if they start to run the ball effectively, they're going to be able to find Jason Witten over the middle, and I just don't know that there's a whole lot of teams that can match up if the Cowboys have a, a solid running game and the defenses are focusing on that. Can they really, um, Can they really stop these three targets? I think that the Cowboys offense is going to be legit this year. I, I definitely expect them to finish in the top 10 among offenses, yeah. and I don't think Houston can keep, compete with that well, in this I, game I, on the road. I remember we talked about it in the preseason. I was just saying I was really high on everybody in Dallas's offense for fantasy purposes. So I was just like, dude, that defense is going to be so damn bad that there's yeah. going to be in 45 to 40 games every single week. But it doesn't really turn out like that. But like you said, no, I think that if the, if, I mean, if the teams have to account for the running game, Romo's going to get his, Dez is going to get his. Terrence Williams right. is this totally underrated receiver. Jason Wynn is still Jason Wynn. That offense is still going to be able to put up points on most people, even if they do absolutely key on DeMarco Murray. Right. So, so yeah, I, I, I think that just straight up for this game, I would definitely pick Dallas to win. Yeah, I, I think so too. So let's talk to about another team that has that a lot of people had high expectations for offensively, but it's been their defense that's actually won them quite a few games so far, and that's the Detroit Lions as they host the Buffalo Bills. Detroit, a seven and a half point favorite, currently the number one defense in the NFL against the pass. Are you shocked about that? Because I certainly am. Well, I, I, I am and I'm not because I think week week four, week five stats can always be misleading. I mean, for God's sakes, the Chiefs had the number one defense for like nine weeks last year and finished like 18th. True. You know, true. so I, I, I never put too much stock into like super early like team stats. I mean, I mean, anyone with eyes can tell you that the Chiefs didn't have a top five defense last year. You know what I mean? But. But the, the but the thing is though is the Chiefs were going up against such bad oh, teams yeah, at the beginning of the year. Every week. Detroit played like Green Bay. Yeah, no fair. I'm I'm not trying to d- discredit them and say that they don't have a, a good pass defense for this year. But I mean, come on, them or Seattle, you know, just based on the stats, right? Or some other right, teams, right. They, they don't have the best pass defense in the league or anything. That's that's crazy. But I think that their defensive line is really the thing that's that's yeah, no, doing Nick the Fair job was this far. Underrated, and Dominican Sue always gets his. I mean, right. Ziggy Ansa had a good rookie year last year too. A lot of people didn't see him because Detroit's just not really in the marquee a whole lot. But Ziggy Ansa had a good year last year. He did. 
He did. So uh, they have a, they have a lot of talent on that. They have three first round picks on that D line, and in Dominic and Sue, Ziggy Ansa, and Nick Fairley. And they also Beasley. brought in Glover Quinn last year to play safety. He's become better. They have pieces on that defense. There's no doubt. Stephen, oh, well, Stephen Tolis out for the year. Excuse me, but DeAndre Levy's been a super <laughs> fast guy. I laugh about that because he injured himself Celebration. celebrating. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is kind of funny. You you wouldn't think that you'd be questioning the Detroit offense, but you sort of are. But having said that, even if um, Joyke Bell misses this game, which I, the reports are mixed right now whether he will or not, but concussion situation. Yeah. But right. Calvin has said that he feels a whole lot better than he did last week, even though he didn't practice today. I think the team still says he full, they fully expect him to play on Sunday and be out there mm-hmm. and actually playing and not just being a decoy. So if all of that holds true, I, I have to think the way the Bills are, Kyle Orton's their quarterback, there's got to be some type of turmoil probably going on just with that alone. Benjamin right. A.J. Manuel four games in. Detroit's kind of, you would expect that offense to get going. I don't see any reason why it can't be this week. Detroit's allowed a TD pass in four games of all game this year. So you, you assume that Matt Stafford and Golden Tate and uh, Eric Ebron, Brandon Pettigrew, Calvin Johnson will get in on that a little bit. I definitely think the Lions at home will probably beat the Buffalo Bills. I think so, too. They're a seven and a half point favorite in this one, and I think there's a reason for it. Obviously, yeah. the the big the big one to me is that, like you said, there's such turmoil on the Buffalo side of the ball right now. I mean, you look at their offense and it's like, OK, I understand EJ Manuel has been world class crap yeah. at quarterback. Him or Tom I Brady get is it. worse. No, I'm just kidding. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. But okay, here's the thing though. You look at a situation like that, and this is something that I always talk about, right? I mean, okay, at a certain point as an NFL team, you do just decide that you're gonna pull the plug on a guy, right? And if that's the decision that Buffalo is making, then just deactivate EJ Manuel. Because well, I mean, you, I mean, you can't do that. Because what if Orton goes down? I mean, then who's your backup situation? I understand his confidence who cares? killed, but who cares? I mean, the thing is, is that you should be looking to move this guy. If he's not going to be your quarterback for the future, there's no reason that he should even be dressed for your team because he should be on the trade block, and there should be no concerns that he's even going to go into a game to potentially get hurt. Because I mean. Look, when you make a decision like this four games into the guy's second year on a bad team, I, I mean... I don't think the Bills are that bad of a team. I think the Bills... They, the, the thing about the Bills... They also got rid of their number one receiver. I but, mean, I understand well, that they, they got, got Sammy Watkins, Watkins but, but look, I mean, if, you're, if you've got a young quarterback, why are you getting rid of his top no, potential target? Yeah, that was it, horrible. It makes no sense. It's not like Stevie Johnson's out there getting $50 million a year. I mean, no, he, he was got signed a, to a very feasible contract. He got it, yeah. yeah, very marginal contract, and it's just it's one of those things where it just it ba- it blows my mind that they do this to a young quarterback. Mm-hmm. And I'm not t- trying to defend EJ Manuel or anything, but it pisses me off when Mike teams Williams, do stuff like this. Oh Mike boy, Williams, Mike Williams! Mike Williams is better than you think. Come on, Mike Williams okay. isn't that bad of a receiver. He's not that bad. That's the way that I would put it. He's not that bad of a receiver. But well, Stevie I mean, Johnson well, has been that team's top target well, for five years. Mike now. Williams or like Doug Baldwin? Who are you picking? Uh, that's a tough situation because I think that Doug Baldwin's. I mean, obviously, if, if we're just looking at them as standard players, um, I mean, I guess I'd take Mike Williams just off of pure physical raw skills. What about Mike Williams or like but DeAndre Hopkins? DeAndre Hopkins, without really? question. Okay, well, without right. question, Mike DeAndre Will- Hopkins right now is one of the top twenty receivers in the game, in my opinion. My- oh, He's a beast. On. Come on, that, dude! That, I am telling you, top twenty, top. Okay, from a fantasy standpoint, I'm telling not you right fantasy, now, not I think fantasy, I'm real life standpoint. But well, look, he's, it's not like he's, it's not like DeAndre Hopkins has got Peyton Manning throwing him the ball. He's, no, he's producing numbers with freaking Ryan Fitzpatrick. Sure. No, I'm, I'm not like, trying to say DeAndre Hopkins is a bad receiver. DeAndre Hopkins is way better than Mike Williams. I, see, I don't I think I like Mike Williams better than you, and that's fine. But the, the one thing I just wanted to say about this was Buffalo, when they made that trade, they gave up their first round pick for next year to go up and get Sammy. They're not trying to be a shit team. They are all in, which is a terrible decision. Don't get me wrong. That is a horrible fucking decision. That is a horribly managed poorly thought out thing but they, they cannot afford to finish bottom five and hand a free first round pick over like that they just can't that, that when they're just realizing oh my god ej Manuel is this bad we fucked up we shit the bet on this pick kyle orton just giving their some give us some stability so we can maybe win this division or at least nine and seven eight and eight it you know because i mean this is if, if there's a year for for them to beat the patriots it's this year it, th- this is Fair. the year that they need to win the, the so I give them – I absolutely shit on them for the Sammy Watkins trade because it was terrible. They should have just kept C.D. Johnson and kept their first-round pick for next year. As soon as they were fouled to them. But they didn't do that. So if they're in this all-in situation that they're in, 
I absolutely I applaud them for being for having the balls to be like, yeah, we messed up with EJ Manuel. We have to admit our mistake, and we're going to try to fill an absolute role player at quarterback. I mean, look at the Jets. They're still starting Geno. You know, they're still lying to themselves with that mistake. Geno Smith the, will never amount to shit. But the Jets the have a, a part of their football team that is actually moderately legitimate. The Bills like, defense is good. The Bills defense has certain players it's that are good. They have a good pass defense, rush. Man. But you're not going to convince me that the Buffalo Bills defense is something that I'm worried about if I'm an opposing offense. I'd be I'm, if about I'm Detroit game. right now, if I'm Detroit right now, am I worried about Buffalo this week? No, but but again, no. it, it's different when you're constantly thrown out there because you're constantly thrown out there because your quarterback is so bad he's three and out and you just get gassed. I that defense I has it, so many good but... players, man. It's got Darius, it's got Kyle Williams, it's got uh, Mario Williams. Williams, Jerry Hughes even yeah. did really good for them. It's got they don't have Kiko Alonso. They brought in Brandon Spikes, who's very good against the run. They have Stephon Gilmore, who's a pretty good corner. They still have they got rid of Jarris Bird, who I thought was they really should have tried to keep in. But Aaron Williams is an okay uh, strong safety. That team has not world class Seattle defensive talent, but it has the talent to be a top ten defense. You just need an offense that doesn't fuck up a whole lot, you know. You can well, the other thing too, all over constantly and three and out and I think you could be okay. The other thing, too, is that they just don't seem to have any explosion in their offense. Um, they need to give C.J. Spiller more carries. They just have which, to. It's so sad because, like, Fred Jackson's more productive than C.J. Spiller. But the thing is, though, is that at a certain point, you can't you can't just trot out a guy that gets four yards per carry every play. And right. I understand C.J. Spiller is going to is going to have those games where he goes 12 carries for 26 yards. Right. He's a I Chris get Johnson it. type of player. But well, he's, he's, yeah, you, but the thing is, though, is one. we've already seen it this year. It's not like C.J. Spiller has just like lost all of his break, you know, uh, breakaway speed. No, he he's got the, yeah, he's I mean, still he got this. the speed. Oh yeah, he's explosive as they come. It's just he's one of those players that you're gonna have to deal with him having, you know, maybe a, a three point one yards per carry until he breaks off that seventy five yard and balances it right. out. That's right. the thing, so, and they've just shown no commitment to keep that going to let him have that opportunity, or at least put him on the field. Yeah. Make the defense account they're, they're for, criminal for God's sake. CJ Spiller. And not that I think that he's some elite, crazy top five talent, but if it you just put goes CJ to show Spiller how Broncos, bad Buffalo is. <laughs> yeah, they're terribly managing players. I mean, if you put, yeah. they're using him nothing like Chan Gailey used him. Chan Gailey understood how to use CJ Spiller, getting yeah. credit for it. And then Doug Marone comes in there and he's just CJ Spiller is a shell of himself. But if you put CJ Spiller on a team like the Broncos in that type of situation, spread him out, I think he'd be great. Yeah, I think I could see that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we're both going to take Detroit in this one, right? Yeah, without it. Yeah, Detroit's, Detroit's winning this game unless something crazy happens. Unless Matt Stafford uh, plays like complete shit. I, I just don't see it happening. Which he's not below. <laughs> he's yeah, not no, above, sorry, I mean. so Carolina game. But. Yeah, so you never know with that. But I, I do like Detroit at home in this one. Next game that we've got is one that I'm, I don't quite understand uh, why people are so excited about Baltimore going into Indianapolis this week, <laughs> but I'm taking Indianapolis pretty convincingly in this one. I I think a three point favorite for They're Indianapolis. Only by three, huh? I like them more than three. Yeah, yeah me too. I do. Um, too. Now, in fairness, Indianapolis hasn't beaten a solid opponent yet. Yeah, they they should have beaten Philadelphia. They got pretty screwed over in that game, so that should have at least been one quality one they should have had. Yeah, I think, you know, the thing is, is Andrew Luck right now has looked as good as anybody in the NFL. Uh, passing the ball, yeah, he's absolutely. mobile. I mean, the guy is the guy is every bit of the line. number one overall pick that you expected him to be. All these people that are out there talking about Russell Wilson's better than Andrew Luck, you can seriously just go straight to hell. Look at the passes that the guy is making. He is on a team where he is carrying that team. I mean, they have no running game to speak of. Yeah, no. I mean, Ahmad Bradshaw, I get it. He's got he's done okay so far from a fantasy standpoint, but their running game is nothing special. And T.Y. Hilton hasn't been what he is normally. Reggie Wayne's aging. Their tight ends are kind of meh. And he Andrew Luck terrible. is still out there putting up baller numbers, man. He is the number one player in fantasy football right now. Truly, truly an elite quarterback already at this point in his career. I understand he's thrown way too many interceptions in his first couple of seasons, but look... When you're on a team where you are constantly having to be the only guy that really does anything on the offense, that's what's going to happen from time to time. Peyton Manning did it, and eventually these guys start to stabilize. They start to see the field better, and we're starting to see that with Andrew Luck. I don't see any way he gets outdueled by Joe Flacco in this game. Yeah, no, I, I pretty much agree with that. The only the only type of concern would be, again, the same concern I had for the Carolina game was just Baltimore can get after the passer, you know, and the Colts defensive line is still bad, and Baltimore still has Terrell Suggs, Elvis Drew, Haloni Nada, Chris Canty. They have guys who can get after the passer. True. So I think if there is if there is one reason to think that this game won't be 
bigger than the spread or Baltimore maybe wins is if Baltimore's defensive line and just, you know, defense in general dominates the Colts. But having said that, I, I still think, I mean, we saw what an insane pass rush can do. We saw what Denver's done. Marcus Ware leads the NFL in quarterback pressures right now. And Andrew Luck just slips away. There were so many game, times in that, in that Denver Indianapolis game and watching, I'm just like, dude, you are a fingertip away from this guy. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> drag him down. And he yeah. breaks it away and throws it 20 yards. And it's just like, fuck me. You yeah. know? Just he, right he's on just the money, that too. guy. Yeah, he's just yeah. that guy. And those plays are pretty routine for him. So I think, yeah, Andrew Luck's on a tear. The Colts defense is better than a lot of people think. It's not a lead or yeah. anything, but it's not it's not a defense the level of like um, the, the Cowboys or the Saints have been so far or anything like that. Right, so right, right. I, I, I think that they'll win. They're at home. Like I, like I said, I think the Baltimore Ravens are kind of getting overhyped right now. What do you think about Steve Smith in this game? I mean, uh, not just from a fantasy standpoint, but does does Indianapolis have a way to shut this guy down? Because he's been well, one of the best receivers in football. Indianapolis so far this has Vontae Davis, who's going to be yep. one of those guys who's going to get up there. Vontae Davis is notorious for just being scrappy as shit and grabby as shit. So yep. we'll see what happens. I, I think that that'd probably be the worst possible matchup if, you, if, you, if, if you're Steve Smith. You don't want to face a guy who's similar size to you. You know, Vontae who's Davis just going to be in your face in the corner. entire game. Yeah, and he's not going to give a shit. He'll just be all over you. He ain't going to respond to your bullshit of throwing him around and stuff. He'll be throwing you around, too. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a 15-yard or two 15-yard penalties oh, yeah. those between guys those two guys bad. in this yeah. game. Vontae so. Davis and Steve Smith are just that's, – that's the matchup to watch for this game. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, all right, so we've both got Indianapolis in that one. Now, the next game that we want to talk about is another one that is uh, in that division, the, uh, the Baltimore division, and that is – Pittsburgh at Jacksonville. Oh God, what's even the point? Well, we can we can <laughs> say that, but look, Pittsburgh shit the bed last week against a team that was a lot of people were saying Tampa Bay was the worst team in the league after the first couple of weeks. I never did um, in fairness, but and the thing is, is that I understand Pittsburgh's the favorite to win this game, but it is in Jacksonville, which eh, what oh, does man that, that whatever ruckus home field advantage. <laughs> Those seventy three fans and everybody, all the, look at all those, <laughs> those fans dressed up fans like chairs. In that pool, yeah, they're in the yeah. pool partying. <laughs> As, as Chad Henney throws another pick. <laughs> the fans go wild. Yeah. They, they thought it was the other team. Throw another um, daiquiri and keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the thing is, though, is I, I look at this and it's okay. Okay. It's Blake Borle's first NFL home start. Right. Okay. Borle's looking um, good, too, in fairness to him. He's been a yeah. lot better than Chad Henney. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's new life. I think there's reason to be somewhat optimistic if you're a Jacksonville fan for this game. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think the 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 thing is, is that the Jacksonville offense has been literally the worst in the NFL through the first four games of the year, and I just I don't really see much of a way that they're able to stop Le'Veon Bell, Antonio Brown, and uh, and Ben Roethlisberger. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with that. The thing is, is Pittsburgh's defense this year has not been very good, but their offense yeah. has been pretty damn good. What and do you Tony, mean Dick LeBeau doesn't just get to like take players and put them into his scheme and they're automatically a top five defense? Funny? You mean that yeah, they actually just, have to have good players on their yeah. defense and, and it's not just, just all that, Dick LeBeau? That myth of Pittsburgh defense that is good every year and just been asked for the last few. Yeah. Yeah, no, they just don't. They're, they're missing with a lot of players right now, too. They panic signed James Harrison off the street to be, like, a, a super significant player for them for the time being. Yeah. Right. Their defense has been banged up. So I do think that Bortles is going to probably be able to put up points against that defense. But the way Antonio Brown, Le'Veon Bell are playing right now, and Ben Roethlisberger, to his credit, they're playing a lot better than I think anyone had them playing so far. Mm -hmm. I just I, I think they'll be pissed off after that game. And frankly, even in that Tampa game, they way outplayed them. Penalties absolutely destroyed them in that game. And they were just making stupid plays. Right. So Tomlin probably got on because of that. I, I don't expect a repeat of that at all. I think I think Pittsburgh probably wins by at least a couple scores in that game. Yeah, I think right now they're a seven point favorite. Um, I like them by slightly more than that. I don't know, you know, somewhere around that range, I guess. But um, yeah, Ben Roethlisberger is going to go out there. He's going to put up decent numbers, and I think that there's going to be plenty of Le'Veon Bell. Uh, from a fantasy standpoint, real quickly, Le'Veon Bell is my number one player overall this week. If yeah. that tells you anything, yeah. so. Uh, very much like the Pittsburgh offense in this one against that horrible Jacksonville defense, and I think that's going to be the big difference in this game. So next game that we have is Dustin's beloved Denver Broncos as they host the Drew Stanton-led Arizona Cardinals, undefeated Arizona Cardinals after three games, guys. Um, Carson Palmer's still not back, but Drew Stanton hasn't looked completely horrible. Yeah, no, I... And also, too, I think they said they were trying to get Carson Palmer back this week, but he didn't practice again today. Yeah. And, again, it's not really one of those things where it's just like, well, how you feel today, Carson? It's like, dude, I can't spin a football. 
So yeah. it's, it's not going to be a tomorrow I'm 100% better. Right. It's, it's right. going to be a, well, how do you feel today, man? Are you making any progress? And, and I do just, you want a guy that's that's injured like that going up against a defense that can get it after the quarterback like Denver can? No, probably not, no matter what. But, I, I, I mean, there's no question that it, if Carson Palmer can play at, at even probably a 75% level, you're playing him over Drew Stanton. Drew Stanton's not. Most likely. Yeah. But I, I still think that Drew Stanton is probably going to get the start because Carson Palmer still can't practice. And there is no way in hell Drew Stanton is coming to Denver and beating Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning's lost two home games in, in the regular season in Denver since he's got there. Two. Since he's been in Denver, he's lost two home games in the regular season. One of The third loss is not going to be to Drew Stanton, guys. People need to calm down. I get the Cardinals are 3-0. and But if, you're, if Denver's 2-1, and if you're looking for the first three opponents, no one's played a harder schedule than Denver. They played three playoff teams. They played three teams who all won 11-plus games last year. And they damn near beat the Super Bowl champions in Seattle. They had an overtime finish where they never even touched the ball. They're going to be pissed off. They, I mean, they lost that game, and frankly, it was probably the best game they played all season. Uh, Defensive-wise, anyways, offensively, probably right. not. But the defense finally was what we all thought it would be on paper versus Seattle. They shut down the Seattle offense for the majority of that game, barring a few plays like the Tlaib TD. But, I mean, it wasn't Tlaib's fault. And a couple other things. The Cardinals' offensive line is still not that good, even though they did get uh, Jared Valdir from Oakland. It's still not a, a good offensive line by any by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, no, they're they're still bad. Denver, they did, still can't run the ball uh, with any sort of yeah, uh, consistency exactly. at all. And Denver's defensive line was very good. Denver's defense as a whole was very good versus the run last year. They've been they've been pretty good this year, minus the game versus Kansas City, minus the game versus Seattle, but. I almost think those are exceptions. The Seattle, I mean, the Kansas City game as a whole was just kind of an anomaly because Denver didn't look they even cared about that game. Looked like they way <laughs> looked ahead to that and to Seattle the next week. They took them way too late. Right, right. But right. Still came out with the win, though. Yeah, that's all that really matters. But that game should not have been that close if you're just comparing the two teams talent-wise. But right. I, I do think that it'll be, I, I could see it being a 10-point game, 14-point game win for Denver because I just, there's no way that Drew Stanton is going to be able to match Peyton Manning for points. West Wild could be back at home. They're going to be coming off the bye week. They're going to have two weeks to prepare for this game. And home, like I said, you expect maybe Demarius Thomas, that was, that extra week was really good for his foot, you know? I hope so. I right. Hope so. Even if he's on Patrick Peterson, Emmanuel Sanders has been amazing this year. West Welk or Julius Thomas, there's just too much firepower. There's just too much firepower for Drew Stanton and the Cardinals to keep up. What do you think about your guy, Monty Ball? Do you think that they're going to be able <sighs> to run the ball effectively in this him. game? No, nah, probably not because it's another yeah. bad matchup for him. If I agree. He's still going to have to go against guys like Dan Williams, Kalias Campbell, you know, those type of guys on that defensive line. And that defensive front seven as a whole has just been – the Cardinals defense is no joke, but it's not like Seattle or anything. I think there's big some big almost uh, – I don't want to say conspiracy, but that's not the word. But there's just been some type of like – bad image out there right now of just like oh man the cardinals defense is crazy and it is it's good defense but it's not seattle people need to calm down they right. won't be going and against i like, agree seattle defense it, the the people keep telling me that you know they have corners and stuff their corners aren't seattle corners and the thing that makes seattle's defense so good in my opinion anyways is those safeties they have cam chancellor and old thomas Correct. who very well might be the two best overall safeties in football period and they're both on the same team exactly and yeah. they have Tony Je- Tony Jefferson and Tyron Matthew who spot starts who spot plays safety every now and then slash nickel corner. It's right. nowhere near that type of playing. Right. I, I think uh Denver has a good chance to put up a, some good points in this game. Um you look at the fact that they're coming off of a loss and the last thing that Peyton Manning did was throw a touchdown pass yeah. and then a two point conversion. An epic drive. Like, like a forty yeah. second drive versus the best like, defense in, in Seattle. I mean, like, look, you see that type of stuff, and it's like, you know, it's it's a clutch moment, and everybody's gonna, everyone's gonna forget that because it doesn't come down as a game winning drive for Peyton Manning on the stat sheet, but that was every bit of a game winning drive. The guy oh, is still as good as it comes at at quarterback. I mean, he's the best he is still very clearly the best quarterback in the NFL right now. Uh, anybody that tries to tell you anything else. They're out of their minds mind. right now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even Andrew Luck, who we, we talked about before, and we were both just gushing about how Peyton good Manning. he looks. He already it, lost yeah. Peyton Manning. So. Well, I hate to look at it like that. I hate to say this guy no, lost I mean, to this guy. Fair, but... but, I mean, yeah, Peyton Manning is still better than Andrew Luck. And I love yeah. Andrew Luck, but, yeah, it's, yeah, Peyton Manning is still the best. Andrew player. Luck could be the next Peyton Manning. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, A couple years uh, down the road, but for right now, it's still Peyton Manning. Right. So, I, I mean, Peyton Manning is going to get his in this game for sure. I think that the thing is, is uh, I think Arizona – their offense 
it really is going to come down to if they hit on a couple big plays. Because if they hit on a couple big plays, if Mike, if Michael Floyd beats Denver's defense deep, like Denver's been beat deep a couple of times this year, if that happens, Arizona can stay in this game. If yeah. they don't have the explosive plays, if Drew Stanton's not able to be accurate like he wasn't in his first game that he played, they're not going to be able to win this game. Yeah. So uh, I'm taking Denver. I, I like them at home, obviously. Uh, if this was on the road, I think it could be closer, but I'm still taking Denver even if they are in yeah, Arizona. So, so uh, yeah, Denver I think pretty easily in this one for me. Next game we want to talk about is the San Francisco 49ers. They're hosting the Kansas City Chiefs. And obviously we saw Kansas City back in full effect on offense running the football with your guy Jamal Charles and of course Niall Davis both of them monsters on the ground Um, but they're going up against a defense that has quietly been one of the I don't even know if I could say quietly but like people just forget that San Francisco's run defense is out of control like if there's one thing that they're really good at it's running run stopping and it's been that way ever since they've had patrick willis yeah minus minus when they go to seattle and they play marshawn lynch right their run defense is out of control good yeah yeah so i have a i have a real question on this in this game if kansas city is even going to be able to move the football because i think that they're going to struggle to run the ball in this one they're going to try to commit to running the ball but it's not like i just don't see a situation where they go out there and rush for 200 yards in a game again i i mean if they get 120 yards between their two running backs that's a good game i think against san francisco oh i completely agree yeah so i mean obviously we see jamal charles is looking at least mostly healthy but um he looked really good yeah he looked like he wasn't injured at all in that game the only reason why i say he looked mostly healthy is because i i have this hydrated yeah, and I and I have this question of if they're going to let him be on the field for the full entirety of the game, given the fact that he has already been hurt this year. Are they going to, you know, kind of wean him back into getting that full load of carries? Are we ever going to see Jamal Charles get a full load of carries ever again this entire season as long as Niall Davis is healthy? I don't know. But I do know that San Francisco's run defense is really damn good, and no matter who's running the ball against them, I have concerns about them. Yeah. And uh, the bottom line is Alex Smith, yeah, he's going back to San Francisco. This might be a, him trying to make a statement type of a game. But look, guys, if anybody knows who Alex Smith is, it's San Francisco. Exactly. They've it's, practiced it's against him. I mean, they know what this guy is. He's not a, a great quarterback. He just isn't. Yeah. So to me, it's San Francisco in this game, I like them by at least seven. Um, San Francisco's offense has been absolutely horrible the past few weeks. I want to see Vernon Davis back on the field because I think when Vernon Davis does get back on the field, it's going to be a different offense. Yeah. But for right now, they're they're kind of lethargic. But I do think that they win this game, you know, maybe a 23 to 16 type of a game, something like that. What do you think about this game? I think we're pretty much in agreement. It, like you said, everyone just kind of sleeps on San Francisco because they haven't necessarily had the huge start which we expect them to always have every single year now since Jim Harbaugh has been there. But nobody's pretty much nobody runs at San Francisco. They still have enough, especially front seven talent, that it just doesn't usually happen. And also, pretty much like you said, too, it's I, I, I can't see a situation where it's like Jamal Charles and Niall Davis going out there in the rush for five yards, six yards, you know, every other touch, and they're moving the chains themselves. I think what more than likely is going to happen in this game is they're going to try to win. They're trying to try to run the ball like they have been. You know, Kansas City is very is super high in terms of like run total, carry totals right now for running back so far in the season. They're trying to run the ball on everybody as they should. They're trying to cover up Alex Smith, but you can only do that if the defense allows you to do it. Because if you're going out there and you're getting stoned for a yard of carry, you know, losing a yard, yard of carry, you just you can't win like that. You go out there, you get two yards, you lose one, you're back at third and nine, and then it's mm-hmm. oh well, we got to got to give Alex Smith the ball because we can't do it. Right. So I, I, I just I, I can't see him beating the San Francisco defense in that type of situation consistently through this game. And also, it, everyone talks about the Alex Smith revenge factor, whatever you want to say. You don't think Colin Kaepernick and Jim Harbaugh want to go out there and prove a point? And, and, and I'm sorry, but I just— I don't I, know if it's quite as big of a point that Alex Smith would because they're the ones that did the, shide, the chiding, not Alex Smith. You know, it's not no, like Alex he, Smith left because he wanted to. Well, no, but, I mean, Jim Harbaugh traded Alex Smith because he directly chose Colin Kaepernick over Alex Smith. He was like, no, we're not going to right. We're going Colin Kaepernick. I'm choosing you. He's going to want to prove he made the right decision. I guess. And especially in a game where Kaepernick hasn't looked that good. Or not in a game, excuse me, in a season where Kaepernick really has not looked that good. And he's if there ever bad. was a time, when yeah. you say when you say not good, I mean he's looked pretty bad. That's what I'm throwing saying. the football. So I, he's looked bad. I think they're going to go out there. They're going to have a type of game plan that's going to set it up so that the, like it, like they really pressure Alex Smith when he is trying to get the ball to make Smith, you know, 
pressured and throw him because Alex Smith is not, he's just not a quarterback who can, who can win games consistently when he's throwing from behind and throwing on long distances throughout a game. They're going to be stacking the box the whole game. If Jamal Charles goes off and has a big game, which he's definitely not below doing by any stretch of measurement. I think Jamal Charles right now is the best running back in the NFL, but, but I mean, I would have thought that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's talent wise. He's insane. He's such a good running back that I, I just think that, if he goes out there as a monster game and they're moving the chains, I, I think Kansas City can win, but I don't see that happening. I, I would definitely probably pick San Francisco to win by probably 10 or ten or 14 points. All right, let's go to another team out there in California who is going to be hosting the New York Jets, and that is the San Diego Chargers. San Diego, one of the hottest teams in the league right now. They knocked off Seattle. Um, they're looking really good this year, and, and New York has just got a complete train wreck at quarterback right now. Yeah. I know you're you're a big guy, a big supporter of Rex Ryan and what he does on that defense. Do you think that defensively alone, essentially, because that's pretty much what all they are right now, or do they have the skills to go in there, stop Phillip Rivers, and get a win in San Diego this week? You know, part of me feels like they do, because I don't think the Chargers are above dropping a game like this to the Jets at home, because I just don't think the Chargers... They're they're a good team. They're a, you know they're a very good team, but they're not an elite team. They're mm-hmm. not, and they're not above losing to a team like the Jets, who are going to make you earn every yard against them most weeks. Right. And they'll still they're going to try to pound Chris Ivy. They're going to try to get Chris Johnson involved. They're going to try and limit Geno. So if the Chargers run defense is enough to snuff, they could do that and get themselves in some good field position situations throughout the game. I, I could definitely see it being a close game. I think a lot of people are immediately assuming it'll be a blowout and all this and that because of San Diego and the way they've looked. And the Phillip Rivers hype right now is out of control. <laughs> yeah, but, it is. Yeah, it's it's absurd. I mean, if you want Phillip Rivers MVP, come on. Phillip Rivers is a good come quarterback. On. He's always been a good quarterback, but MVP level, nah. Yeah, no, nah, Especially, it, 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 you can come talk to me with the MVP argument if they finish ahead of Denver. You ain't winning right. MVP finishing second in your division. And Peyton Correct. Manning's lost to him one time in two years in five meetings in the last two years. So I don't see it happening. Yeah, but it's it's going to be tough. Yeah, if, if he has if he finishes below Peyton Manning, there's not even a point to even bring it up because you're not winning MVP finishes second in your own division. Having said that, for this game, because of how bad Geno Smith is, because of just how inept that, dot, that Jets offense looks so, so many weeks, I still, I'd pick the Chargers to win this game. I think it'll be closer than people think. I could see it being a seven point, three point game, but I would still pick the Chargers to win. I'm taking the Chargers too, but I want to ask you a question specifically about the Jets quarterback situation. And obviously you've got Mike Vick sitting on the bench there. Now you're Rex Ryan. You've made two bad decisions at quarterback in your tenure. Uh, and I say you because I, to me, I, I don't put I, much stock into that. <laughs> look, I know, I know that he's not the one that makes the final decision. He's probably not the one who scouts these players even, but look, The bottom line is that when you're an NFL head coach, these quarterbacks are tied to your name, whether you like it or not. And he's had Mark Sanchez and Geno Smith, and both of them have looked world-class bad. They acquired Mike Vick. I know Mike Vick is past his prime. I get it. But, like, don't you maybe consider putting him on the field just to give your offense, like, a little bit of a spark? Or do you think that it's a, it's at the point now where, I mean, because Geno Smith has just looked so awful. Uh, I'd say worse than EJ Manuel. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I said last year I thought he was the best star, or the worst starter in the league. So Yeah, and, and the, the Bills had no problem setting, sitting him. I mean, the does, the yeah. same, does the same philosophy apply to the Jets that applied to the Bills? Because, look— my opinion is the Jets are a better overall team than the Bills are. And if you're making the argument that it was smart for the, for the Bills to move to Kyle Orton, I think you almost have to make the same argument to move to Mike Vick. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, like I said, I gave the Bills some credit because I think they had at least the, you know, wherewithal and, and intelligence to be like, yeah, we fucked up and wanted to at least we made him, we're at least willing to admit we made that mistake. And there's a lot right. of teams that just put that, don't let that happen because they're, they get too, they, yeah, they let their ego get too much in the way. So, again, yeah, I give the Bills a lot of credit for just having the balls to be like, yeah, we messed up and we're going to move on and we're going to see what happens. But, no, I, I, it, Rex Ryan actually had an interview versus, with a, a New York radio station earlier this week, too. And it, without directly coming out and saying it, it m- sounded like, yeah, I'd bench Gino if it was my decision. But hmm. it really sounds like that he's sort of having his hand tied by the GM that they brought in who, from Seattle, whose name is slipping me right now. Yeah, um, I don't recall. Yeah, they brought him from Seattle, and he was the one who did the Chris Ivory trade. He he wanted the one who wanted. He's the one behind Gino that wanted Gino. There have been some things recent or not recently, but um, when Gino was drafted, it said that Rex Ryan didn't have a whole lot of input in that one. He had input in the Sanchez one, but not the Gino uh, draft. So, 
I mean, here's the thing about Geno and why I think it's a little bit of a different situation is EJ Manuel is the first quarterback taken in that draft, and they took him in the first round with their first round pick. The Jets waited until the second to take Geno Smith. Yeah, it almost seemed I mean, like they were just like, well, fuck, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess this guy's, everybody said this guy's the best quarterback available. Like, I guess we kind of have to take him just because we're in such a bad situation. But it almost makes you think, like, I, I almost wonder if they would be in a better situation right now if Mark Sanchez was the, still their quarterback. I think they'd be in a better situation than, G- dude, Gino's like the worst starter in the league. Like, Well, Mark Sanchez is one of the worst starters, too. No, nah, but, but like, he, was, he was never, there was never a point where he was ever Gino bad. There was a point where it's like there were some games, but oh, yeah, yeah sporadic games every now and then. Sure, I mean, yeah. he just had his moments where he just looked terrible. But yeah, Gino's never had that just epic performance where it's like, man, he looks like a real NFL quarterback. He just looks terrible. You know what, Gino's so. like shining moment so far in, in his entire NFL tenure. What? Is you remember Week One versus Tampa last year, and they were going to lose the game for sure, and he randomly bootlegs out of bounds and gets hit. <laughs> Yes. He gets late hit by Levante David and it moves him up 15 <laughs> yards and they kick a field goal. And the motherfuckers on his on the side with his hands raised like he's Jesus. Yeah. Like, dude, fuck off. You're dead to me after that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you get hit out of bounds on a late <laughs> hit. And that's your statement thing in the NFL so far. Like, you're a joke. He's terrible. Yeah, he's looked really bad. Not to mention, he just looks stupid. He just has that stupid look on his face. He doesn't look like times. he knows what the fuck he's doing at any point. Yeah, every time he makes that, that pick um, by. um. Who is the the DB that picked him in the the, the screen pass uh, pick six? Oh, God. Who was it? Uh, who did the Jets play last week? It was the was the Lions? It was the week before that. Oh gosh, you're putting me on the spot. I don't recall know, off the top it's, of it's my head. It's slipping my head too. It's slipping my mind too. It was whoever he threw it to, and he literally it was just like, what the hell did you just do? You threw yeah. a, a pass behind the line. There was a pick six. Like how, how does that happen to a competent, to even a semi competent NFL quarterback? He just looks dreadful. Yeah, he's been he's been really rough, and like I said, um, I I feel like there's a bigger reason to put Mike Vick on the field than there is Kyle Orton, uh, and I want to see that happen. And the reason that I say that is because I think Mike Vick brings a new element to the offense that Kyle Orton just doesn't for Buffalo. I think Kyle Orton's like, okay, so we go out there and we run the same stupid offense that we're currently in. Like, who really cares? But at least when Mike Vick's on the field, like. I mean, we saw in the in the the, one? the last time he's been on the field, the guy can still move. And granted, he's completely. I mean, he's going to make just terrible decisions. He's that's probably going to get hurt. Right. But and look, could it be any worse than Geno? No, that's the thing. Is I don't think it could be worse. <laughs> but a team that, if there ever was a team that really just needed to copy the Dallas philosophy of just run the ball, you know, give your defense more rest and whatever else, the Seattle philosophy of just pound pound it with the running game. It would be the Jets. If you get a guy yeah. in there like an Alex Smith, even, they can just hand the ball off enough, you know, make get to third and shorts or whatever. It's just keep moving the chains, that type of quarterback, limit mistakes. They need a quarterback like that so bad. Right. right. And they just have no one on the roster. And, and granted, Vic is better, but he's not what that offense needs. So we're both taking San Diego in this one, correct? Yeah, without a doubt. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's going to be San Diego in this game for us. Um, we haven't really disagreed on a whole lot of picks so far, but... Uh, I think we might. Eh, we have I don't one. know. Yeah, we'll 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 see what we do on these final two here. But um, Cincinnati at New England. New England, typically one of the teams that you look at and they're at home and you just expect them to crush everybody. That has not been the case so far. Uh, they almost lost to Oakland at home earlier this year, and they looked absolutely horrendous against Kansas City. I mean, these are two games that you should have written onto your schedule before the season even started as being wins for New England. And, I mean, they have looked really, really bad this year. The only game that they've really shown up is against Minnesota, and that was their defense. I think Skip Bayless said the Patriots are going 15-1. and (laughs) Oh, gosh, Skip Bayless. He He is such a ridiculous SOB. Let's talk about this one because I know your opinions on the New England Patriots are, have always been that they're overrated going into the season. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, is it at the point now where you start to just look at their games and it's like, you know, if they're playing a moderately good team, they're getting that L? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I sort of think so. I, I don't think the Patriots are going to go 6-10. and 10. I just don't because I think that they're going to still win some games. They still play in – right now what probably is the worst division in football is the AFC East right now Patriots included in that so look at look at those quarterback situations oh they're all division. dreadful yeah Tannehill they wanted to bench him Geno should be benched they already benched EJ Brady probably should be benched 
The only yeah. reason that the only reason that the Patriots don't have the same type of quarterback uh, drama that all three of the other teams. I mean, we're four weeks into the season, and all three of the other teams have quarterback drama. Yeah. The only reason that the Patriots don't is because it's Tom Brady. Yeah. I mean, you you call you're him Joe Schmo, and yeah, exactly. yeah you would call him Joe Schmo, and it's like you're at the situation where you're looking at this guy that you drafted to potentially come in there and replace Brady down the oh, road. Absolutely. Yeah. No, Brady has looked. The thing about Tom Brady, too, is Tom Brady looked terrible last year, too, and they went on defense, and their running game really, really carried them throughout week, what, 13, 14 into the postseason. I mean, I don't think Tom Brady threw a TD in the entire postseason. I think it was – oh, no, yeah. excuse me. I think he did one. But other than that, it was LeGarrette Blount. LeGarrette Blount was running for, like, 200 yards for the yeah. end of the season again. It was just like, okay. LeGarrette Blount, yeah. Yeah, it was like, okay, they're just going to get carried by LeGarrette Blount now. And you can say, oh, Brady made – got him to the AFC Championship game. Anyone that watched that team last year, that team did not get carried by Tom Brady at any point in the season. Tom Brady was about as big of a success to that team as uh, Alex Smith was to that 11-5 and five run. You know, he was just... And, he's and they have a tough team. matchup this week. Oh, yeah. Cincinnati. Cincinnati probably has the second best defense in football right now. Andy Dalton. Possibly playing. the best team in football. All around. Possibly. Yeah, you can make the case, certainly. I mean, A.J. Green, they, they expect to get Marvin Jones back this week, too. Giovanni Bernard and Jeremy Hill. Yeah, nasty. Smash I mean, smash. that's a pretty dirty running combination, and they're th- throwing Great the ball effectively. Andy Dalton line. doesn't hasn't had any Andy Dalton moments this year, yeah. where he looks terrible. Yeah. So, I mean, as long as Andy Dalton doesn't throw the game away in in these games, their defense is good enough to keep them in any game against just about any team. And they're going to be able to run the football super effectively. So this is yep. kind of a team that is a sneaky, at this point in the year, sneaky, good chance to win the Super Bowl this year, in my opinion. The Bengals. The thing yeah. about Andy Dalton, his playoff record is so damning. He's so yeah, bad. But... He, I mean, and I get you don't put a lot of stock in the guys just turn bad in the playoffs. But yeah, it's not so much has happened one time. It's happened like three times that he has okay. just been a complete detriment to his team. I, I get so, it. He's got to win that first playoff game for me to and not and, and not just get carried by his other team to be like, I give this team a realistic shot to out duel player like Philip Rivers or out duel player like Peyton Manning or because you know sooner or later it's going to be can we outscore this team and if Andy yeah. Dalton's out there going you know ten to twenty for a TD and a pick he's not beating Peyton Manning. He's just but not. as long as their defense is able to keep teams to twenty four or fewer points, I think that Andy Dalton's able to put the the points on the board. I think most weeks games. he can certainly. I, I, so. This week he'll be able to. This week, I don't see any way they lose to the Patriots because the Patriots are just playing terrible right now. Darrell Rivas is just getting destroyed by Dwayne Bowe, which is the fuck, just the worst sign ever for your overrated. <laughs> yeah, and- well, a- another thing that I found to be interesting about this game is that I, I and I don't know if this is 100% for sure, but I'm pretty sure that earlier in the week, I saw that New England was like a two-point favorite in this game. So and stupid. I believe I believe that's flipped now, which is very rare in the NFL that a, an odd... Uh, and odds has switched from one team to another. A lot of times you'll see it, you know, move up or down Spread a point. change a little bit. Yeah. But it's very rare that you're going to actually see the favorite flip. But I think it actually has. It's gone to a one-point favorite for Cincinnati now. Common sense um, finally kicking in for people. And but just even still, Patriots. like, a one-point favorite basically means that, they, that they're that they calling it's this a toss-up. Yeah. I don't think this is a, co- a coin toss at this point. Um, I... I I'm pretty confident that Cincinnati has the skills to beat New England. No, yeah, I, they're, they have the things that that New England is struggling. That New England they're struggled like crazy to run the or to stop the run this past week against Kansas City. Cincinnati's better offensively with running the ball than yeah. Kansas City. Uh, defensively, New England couldn't move the ball through the air whatsoever. Cincinnati has a great way secondary. Better secondary. Yeah, so, way better I mean, Kansas you City. look at those two things alone, and it's like, I the don't see how New England wins nasty. this game. The home field advantage is pretty nasty in Kansas City, which, yeah. well, for that for that game specifically, it was a good home True. field advantage in that game. So that'd probably change And New things. England is home right. for this game. But, but they won't have the pressure of the crowd. But still, like they're just you, you can't just make Tom Brady good again. He's just not good. He's right. not a good quarterback right now. And another thing, too, about this one, and another reason that I really like Cincinnati in this game is because they're having that extra week to prepare, which we talked a little bit about. Um, I think it's overrated a little bit at this point in the season, but it is still something to think about. But the big thing is that A.J. Green was not healthy to start the season. Yeah, same with Demarius. Um, That's what we I, like to, I, I wonder if he's going to look better. I wonder if he's, he's going to look good. like the real A.J. Green. Minus Not that, that he's been he bad fantasy-wise, but you haven't seen the explosion that you usually see out of A.J. Green. Um, and the other thing, too, is that I've I've heard that Marvin Jones might be back for this yeah. game. But he's been practicing this week, even though I actually tweaked his ankle a little bit in practice today. 
which is kind of shitty because I mean, he's just coming back from that foot yeah, injury. But they said it's right. not related to the foot. Okay. And they expect him they're going to take it day by day with him. But yeah, they okay. might get him back, which could open things up a little bit more because Marvin Jones caught, what, 10 TDs last year? Yeah, he was. I mean, he's just another threat, is all. Right. Um, not just that I expect Marvin Jones to. Green. Exactly. I don't expect him to be the guy or anything. But, I mean, anytime that you start to get offensive firepower back, uh, you get your A.J. Green healthy, you get your uh, your guy who was at least a, a moderately decent second receiver, and then you still got Mohamed Sanu, too. Um, you Jermaine know, not Gresham. that he's. Yeah, and not that he's been some spectacular player, but, I mean, he's been out there making a couple plays. He, he caught a couple of nice passes. He threw a pass. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's been some interesting things that have happened with the Cincinnati offense. I think they're better coming out of the bye week than they were going into it, and that spells trouble for New England. I'm taking Cincinnati by at least six in this one. Yeah, me too. So, final game of the week, and I don't understand how the hell this one made it onto primetime. It's kind of uh. embarrassing. But uh, this could be a complete blowout. Seattle at Washington. At least it's not Washington at Seattle. When we first looked at this game, we actually thought it was Washington at Seattle. And we were like, what the hell? Yeah. But no, uh, Seattle is on the road at this one. They're going across the country. They're not going to the state of Washington. In case you guys didn't realize, yes, Washington <laughs> is Washington, D.C. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, some people don't know that. Um, but, yeah, Seattle is going to be up against the Redskins. Man, Kirk Cousin looked absolutely horrible the last time that we saw him Seattle is uh you know still the best defense in the NFL I don't see how Seattle doesn't walk out with a win in this game yeah that's the thing there's really no nothing you can tell yourself that'll be like well I think that Washington could pull like no no it's just it's not a possibility it's a Call terrible titties terrible if you think that Washington's winning this game yeah there's I don't think it's even gonna be close and I I still like Kirk Cousin which is funny but like yeah. I I don't see any way they beat Seattle I just don't. I understand it's not at home. Seattle's not the same team at home. They're still a good team, but they're not that elite, out of control. I don't know if anyone can beat this team like they are in Seattle most weeks. Yeah, but even then, on the road to San, to San Diego. Yeah, even Seattle at seventy percent or whatever you want to assume they are on the road, they're still so much better than Washington. It's not even funny. Right. Like I think that game will be a two, three, four score game. Maybe it's not even worth watching. Probably. Yeah. And it's, it's unfortunate book. because Monday Night Football has been brutal this year with blowouts. Yeah, terrible. Just well, blowout I mean, after blowout. Like, so. Even if RG3 is still healthy, like, what the fuck are you thinking scheduling that game for Monday Night Football? Like, Washington and Seattle? I guess maybe the only thought that I can think of is, like, you know, them wanting to make the drama between RG3 and, RG3 and, and uh, Russell, Russell Wilson. Wilson. Like, there's any yeah. competition Which in that quarterback in is better? No. Yeah, there's any competition in that. Yeah. Like, no, RG3 just looks like an asshole. Russell Wilson's pretty good, so like no. <laughs> Russell Wilson's pretty okay at throwing the football, and RG three yeah. looks like he's just. And RG three uh, uh, isn't. He looks like he's a character from a Bug's Life, yeah. and he's terrible. He's so. just the worst quarterback. Him and Tom Brady are gonna have a good time to tell. Have gonna have a good time. They open up their joint bar and they're both retired and they <laughs> suck ass in football. <laughs> they love Tom and Tom and Bob's Wing Shack in Detroit. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we've we've joked about this, but, uh, you know, Seattle still, uh, I know that they're, they've they got the, um, the, the thing that people are looking back to as a hope is that they did lose on the road to San Diego. And, yes, they are not impenetrable. They can lose, especially on the road. But Washington is just, to me, not the team to do it. Yeah, um, you got to be able to hold the ball versus them. You got to be able to con- constantly convert third downs, consistently convert third downs, excuse me. You got to play time of possession with Seattle to win like that, and the man with San Francisco or San Diego did, and there's just no, there's just no way. Alfred Morris is probably not going to see very much running time at all versus right. them. There's just, there's no way. And the thing that's, the thing that I think swings it even just a little bit more is that the tight end situation in Washington now is just like oh, a barren brutal. wasteland because yeah. they had a lot of talent. Jordan Reed, Niles Paul. I love Jordan Reed. Yeah. I love Niles Paul. <laughs> but you know, you look at they these got guys Logan now, Paulson. Yeah, now you look at you've got Logan Paulson, and it's just it's not the same thing. And we don't know for certain whether these guys aren't going to play at this point. I don't think looks unlikely um, though. Yeah, it's looking unlikely for both guys, which means Kirk Cousins, uh, who really was able to find the tight ends early in the season, he's not going to have that just over the middle, you know, Security area blanket. that you can beat these guys potentially. Just like you know, picking up six seven at a time versus you know trying to go deep against the Shermans and the the Earl Thomas and the Camp Chancellors. 
um, it, it's going to be so tough for them to win this football game if they can't convert those third downs, like you said. And that's really where the tight end a lot of times comes into play. Yep. I don't like Logan Paulson. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think Seattle is going to win this one by, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to say 13. And they're currently a seven and a half point favorite. So I like them uh, to beat those odds as well. Yeah. But, uh, that's pretty much going to wrap things up for this week's uh, pickums. I know it was long, guys, but uh, I will definitely, uh, you know, think about trying to figure out a way to cut this down. But we have so much that we like to talk about, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you press that like button below. If you're new to the channel, of course, make sure you press that subscribe button, and uh, that'll let you know when I put out any new content. I have a ton of Madden content, of course. We do fantasy football swagger podcast here with Dustin and I. But um, make sure that you guys do tune in later this week. We'll probably have it either Friday evening, Saturday morning, uh, as far as the Fantasy Football Swagger podcast for the preview for these games. Uh, we'll go in-depth about the players that we like, the players we don't like for this week. We kind of gave you a little bit of a preview in this video if you did watch the whole it was thing. Yeah. yeah. But uh, we do appreciate all the support. If you guys enjoyed it, make sure you drop a comment below. Let us know what you guys think. Let us know if you guys disagree with us on any of these picks because we uh, we agreed with ourselves on a lot of them. I think the only real one that we disagreed on was Cleveland and Tennessee, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Got Tennessee, that's the only one. But yeah, so but this we'll week see. seems a little bit more safer in a lot of these picks than they usually it does. are, though. It probably, it does. probably won't be that way going forward. There's a lot of good teams against bad teams this yep, week and exactly. a lot of good teams at home. Yep. So, uh, so yeah. So with that being said, guys, like I said, that is going to wrap up today's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And we will talk to you beautiful bitches again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>